Hello, this is Miss Schiller, and I'm going to read Chapter 8 from Fallen Angels by Walter Dean Meyer. Um, and it starts on page 97. What's your name, soldier? Perry, sir. Look, Perry, we're going out on a sector patrol. What we want to do is establish a presence. We're not looking to get into a firefight. We see anything, we call in artillery. You have any questions, you ask me, okay? Yes, sir. If we do get into anything, make sure you report any body count. One last thing, you stay close to Scotty over there. Scotty's our machine gunner. You can feed for him. Lieutenant Doyle was nervous and short. He cupped a cigarette in his hand the way I thought Humphrey Bogart would have. Charlie Company was going out in two sectors. The first platoon went out first. The third and fourth platoon, the one that I was assigned to, were going next. And the second platoon was going to be backup in case anybody got into trouble. Scotty was about six foot five with a face that was mostly ashy white. But the eyes were what set him apart. They were dark and darting. I had seen the look on ball players before. They were the kind of eyes that wanted to win. I was nervous being with these new guys. Scotty must have sensed it because he came over and told me everything was going to be cool. Where are you from? New York, I said. Harlem. You a long way from home, man. Where are you from? Tacoma, Washington, he said. Doyle, tell you about the stand down? No. Charlie Company is going to be the first company that stands down, Scotty said. We'll be standing down for two weeks, maybe even get down to Saigon. The whole battalion standing down? From what I hear, Scotty said, and this boy needs a little vacation. Far as I'm concerned, we can stand down till this thing's over. I heard it could be over before Christmas. Can't be too soon for this boy, Scotty said. Some guys were getting ready to move out, and Scotty got up and shouldered the 60 caliber machine gun. I crisscrossed two battalioners of ammunition over my chest and grabbed a box full. It was heavy as hell. We went to the pads and then sat down waiting for the choppers. I liked the idea of standing down. A few weeks away from the combat zone would do me good. If we went to Saigon, maybe we could see what the cities were like before the war was over. Two black guys came over and asked me if I was new. I said no, that I was on loan from Alpha Company. Then they asked me if I knew a guy named Gifford in Alpha. I didn't. Scotty introduced me to a couple of other guys, but I forgot their names as soon as I heard them. Lieutenant Doyle was yelling into the radio that the choppers were late. He was asking if the guys on the other end of the phone wanted to go to the backup position. The best I could figure out, the answer was no. You play ball, Scotty asked. Basketball, I said. Played some baseball, but nothing to brag about. I played football in high school, but couldn't get into a college. You know the thing... The only thing I'm good at? What? M60 machine gun. You know anybody out in the world need a good machine gunner? I smiled. My mind shot ahead. What would I do when I got out? I had read some stuff in Stars and Stripes about Congress expanding the GI Bill. The paper said it didn't look too hopeful. The chopper finally came, almost an hour after they were supposed to. We got in and took off. The landing zone was supposed to be secure, but I could see a few muzzle blasts coming from the thick green carpet below me as we came down. I flinched every time I saw one. Scotty and another guy, his name tag read Palumbus, kidded me about the flinching. If you see the muzzle blast, it means the bullet missed. He had a lot to learn about physics, but we were already landing. The struts were supposed to take the jolt out of the landing, but I wanted to be out before they hit. Scotty was just as I was thinking of going, went just as I was thinking of going, and in a moment I was out and running behind him. The ammo box banged against my legs. It felt as if I were carrying a ton of equipment. We moved out quickly from the landing zone and went into some tall grass. The grass cut my hands up so fast I thought I had walked into a booby trap. I couldn't believe it. It was like a thousand paper cuts all over me. We had to cross a road and Doyle was telling everybody to look out for mines. I don't know why he tells us that, Scotty says. They don't put the damn mines so you can see them and we ain't got no detectors. A picture of Jenkins flashed through my mind. I couldn't even look down. I just watched Scotty's back as we crossed the road. We found the area we were supposed to be in and dug in. Scotty had empty sandbags in his rucksack and we filled them with dirt and made ourselves a little nest. Doyle was 20 meters away. The radio guy was with him and by the time Scotty and I had finished our nest, Doyle and the radio guy were playing cards. I was just going, we are just going to stay here, I asked. Doyle, don't go too far, Scotty said. He don't think this is his war anyhow. He says him in Seneca Station, he's got him a Seneca Station back in New, New Jersey. He got drafted? He got drafted four years ago, but he changed his name and stayed low. Scotty said, 
Then the FBI caught up with him and brought him in. He got big connections and got into officer's candidate school. Two jets streaked across the sky, beautiful, dark birds in a sweeping arc across a silver sky. You join up, Scotty asked. Yeah, nothing to do in the world. Me either. That's why they give these dances, Scotty says. We sat for a half hour, then Doyle told us we be moving out in 15 minutes. Scotty and I had just started to unload the sandbags when the shooting started. 450, 450, the shout went down the line. Someone had spotted where the firing was coming from and estimated it to be 450 meters in front of me. Scotty was leveling the legs of the tripod and I jerked open the metal ammo case. Get that thing going, Doyle was yelling at us. I looked up and saw that he was on the radio. The radio man was firing at a line of small trees. I wasn't scared. For the first time, I wasn't scared. I didn't see anybody, no muzzle flashes. I was going to be okay. Scotty started firing the 60. There were traces in the belt, and I could see the rounds spit across the distance. Leaves and small branches in front of us seemed to jump into the air. I kept feeding, but I didn't see anything. Doyle let the firing continue for a long time before calling out for us to cease fire. I watched him. He peered around above the dirt mound he was behind. You want to squat out? Doyle, or Scotty called to Doyle. I'm calling for Willie Peter, Doyle called back. That's Doyle for, Doyle for you, man, Scotty said. Whatever or whoever started the shooting probably didn't even see anything, but he's still going to call for a couple of rounds of Willie Peter just in case. We waited for another minute before a lone round of white phosphorus landed in the distant trees. We're too close to be calling in artillery, Scotty said. One of our machine guns started chattering on our right, and Scotty opened up again. A moment later, some more white, white phosphorus started coming in. The Willie Peter sent streamers of fire into the air. The smell of it was terrible. Terrible and scary. Just the idea of being hit by a white phosphorus barrage sent a chill through me. The barrage lasted for 15 seconds, then stopped it abruptly. Scotty nudged me and pointed towards Doyle. Doyle had his helmet off and was screaming into the radio. He was gesturing wildly, and then he stood up and looked toward the target area. The radio man stood and looked, too. The machine gun on the right opened up again, and Doyle started screaming, Cease fire! Cease fire! Doyle was jumping around and waving both of his arms over his head. Oh, shit! Scotty turned around and leaned against the sandbags. What's up? I asked. I hope not what I think it is, Scotty said. We waited as Doyle walked a little ahead of his position, hands on his hips, and looked out to the field ahead of us. Behind us, I heard choppers. I turned and saw them headed for us, then went by us out to the target zone. Hey, Scotty, did we? Yeah, we just shot the shit out of our first platoon. We walked slowly across the field. There were some kind of crops being grown in between the trees. Half of it now is burned out or uprooted by the shelling. As we got near the first platoon, the smell from the phosphorus grew stronger. They were loading the guys into the medevac choppers. Medics were running from guy to guy. Look in the bushes, a captain was shouting. We looked for wounded. They were all over the place. The medics were so busy they were just tagging guys. The ones they thought they could save, they worked on. The others, they marked their wounds down. One kid, the angry stain of blood on his t-shirt growing with every breath, watched calmly as the medic rode up the tag. The medic tied it to his lapel and patted the kid's shoulder. When the medic left, the kid tried to read the tag without taking it off. If there was time, if the medic had finished with the ones he had fairly, was fairly sure he could save, he would come back to the kid to see where he, what he could do. I, let, I kept looking for other wounded. These were our people. The first chopper was moving out already. They were so quick. One guy had a plasma bottle strapped to his helmet. He was going through his pockets looking for matches to light his cigarette. He found them, but they were soaked through with his own blood. Scotty lit a cigarette. A sergeant was crying. He was sitting by himself, his rifle cradled in his arms, crying softly. Nobody was talking. There was nothing to say. More medevacs came and took away the rest of the first platoon. The last one took... The last one took the body bags. There had to have been at least 15. We went back to the land, landing zone an hour later. They had brought in the standby platoon to replace us. A spec four from the first platoon had wandered away from the company and was riding with us. He was a young kid, really good looking. He had burns on his arms and face. Both eyebrows were gone, but he was still good looking. He was so young. Where are you from, I asked. Charlie Company, sir, he said. I started to tell him that I wasn't an officer, but it didn't matter. As soon as we landed, I was told to go back to my company. Scotty said it was nice meeting him, or nice meeting me. You okay? Lieutenant Carroll was the first to meet me. Yeah, sure. 
You know, the way they run this shit over the radio? Lieutenant Carroll shook his head. You would think all hell was breaking loose. When I got to the hut, Pee-wee asked me what had happened. We heard that you guys ran into a VC battalion or something, he said, because I told them that Perry could handle the shit out of it if it was only one damn battalion. I was with their fourth platoon, I said. We ran into their first platoon and we hit them. They must have had lost a dozen guys. You hit our own guys, Monaco came over to where I was sitting on the bed. I didn't hit them. The platoon leader called in the artillery on their position. Who spotted them, Monaco asked. I don't know. Nobody knows nothing. That's why a bunch of guys get nailed for no reason. Yo, man, I didn't mess them up. Monaco looked at me and walked away. I watched him lie down on his bunk with his face to the wall. They messed up bad, Pee Wee asked. Yeah, real bad. Thanksgiving. This year, Kenny's birthday was on Thanksgiving, and I damn near forgot. I figured it would take three weeks for anything to reach home from Nam. I didn't want to spend or to send him money. He could have used the money, but I wanted to send him something more. I asked Lieutenant Carroll if he thought I could get a knife in the mail. I, I told him it was for Kenny. Lieutenant Carroll said he had something else, and he gave me a jacket he had bought in Sagan. It was black silk, and there was a map in green of Nam in the back. I wanted to pay him for it, but he said no. I got the jacket in the last mail. Lieutenant Carroll was in the officer's hooch, and I stopped in to see him. He was sitting in his shorts. He was drinking from a bottle of Jack Daniels. You know where I got this? Where? We went into a village about six months ago. I guess we surprised some VC. They left their meal, their cards, and this bottle behind. You want a drink? I took a drink. It burned like hell going down. It came up easier. I couldn't sleep. They all started crowding in on me. The guy with the plasma taped to his helmet, the sergeant crying. None of them were together in my mind. They just kept coming one by one. Short movies. A few seconds of a medic putting a tag on a wounded soldier. A few seconds of a chopper taking off over the trees. A guy cradling his rifle. A body bag. The guys that our artillery blew away didn't have a reason to die. They, didn't, they hadn't faced, died facing the enemy. They had just died because someone else was or scared, maybe even careless. They died because they were in Nam, where being scared made you do things you would regret later. You were killing our brothers, ourselves. Brew was getting ready to go to bed, and I went in over to his bunk and asked him if he knew where the Lord's Prayer was in the Bible. The Bible I, ha I got has an index, he said. You can look up anything you want in the back. Hey, that's cool. You can borrow mine anytime you want, he said, tossing it to me. You pray a lot in, when you were in the world, I asked him. Yeah, I prayed a lot, Bruce said, but man, I didn't pray nowhere near as hard. So that's the end of chapter 8, page 107. Hope you enjoyed it.